morning, guys. I have to tell you something. Um, I baptized a lot of people, and um, I think that's the fastest I've ever changed. And so, <laughs> so I appreciate you, Pastor Peter, if you're listening, uh, for using the amount of words that you did, and not less, uh, because, well, that could have been embarrassing. And so, <laughs> anyways, it is so good to see you today. Uh, today we are in the last leg of our series called God of Old. And if you haven't been with us, this has been a long, marinating season in the Old Testament portion of the Bible. It started in September of last year, uh, and we'll be done, actually, at the end of this month. So we have about four weeks uh, left to it. And part of the reason that we've done it this way is to, one, uh, get a good overview look at the Old Testament. It represents about two-thirds of the Christian Bible. And for most of us, we're relatively unfamiliar. And so on the one side, it helps us to kind of understand the story of what God's doing. But in addition to that, what we see in the Old Testament is a more filled out representation of what God is like. Certainly, we see what God is like through Jesus. I'm not trying to minimize that. But you see God at work in different stories and in different circumstances all throughout the Old Testament. Now, as we approach today, where we've landed so far is very close to the end of the story as a story. We're pretty, we're pretty near there. But if we were to end right now, it would be a very depressing place to stop. You see, God's people who were called through a man named Abraham all the way back in the first book of the Bible, that people group is in exile. That people group has consistently run away from God rather than running to him. And so if we were to stop today, it would be a very abrupt ending without a lot of hope as we look forward to the New Testament. But thankfully... The Old Testament doesn't end on quite that note. There's actually some really beautiful stories, some beautiful prophetic statements of God that, hey, in the future, by the way, it's all going to be better. And over the course of the next few weeks, these are the stories and the prophecies that we're going to look at together. Today, we're looking at one of the weirdest books of the Bible. But in it, is perhaps one of the most lovely representations of this future hope. What we have in Jesus that is in front of us. And so I'm excited to dive in with you today to the book of Ezekiel. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for uh, this incredible day, a chance to see people's lives transformed through baptism, I thank you, Lord, so much for communion, for the sacrifice that you have made for us. And I thank you, Lord, for your word that we get to dive into it together. Lord, I pray that in this time, your words would be what comes through, not my own. I pray, Lord, for clarity as we digest this really cool but really challenging book um, in a very short period of time. I pray that you would speak. I pray, Lord, against any distraction in all of our hearts. I pray, Lord, that we would um, be able to receive what it is you would have us receive, we just thank you. You're a good God, and it's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, if you have a Bible and you would like to turn there, you can turn to Ezekiel chapter 47. And don't worry, if you don't have a Bible with you, we'll have it on the screens to my left and to my right. We're going to read Ezekiel chapter 47, starting in verse 6. And it says this, he asked me, have you been watching, son of man? Then he led me back along the riverbank. When I returned, I was surprised by the sight of many trees growing on both sides of the river. Then he said to me, this river flows east through the desert into the valley of the Dead Sea. 
The waters of this stream will make the salty waters of the Dead Sea fresh and pure. There will be swarms of living things wherever the water of the river flows. Fish will abound in the Dead Sea, for its waters will become fresh. Life will flourish wherever the water flows. Okay. So in our time today, we're going to do a very brief overview of the book of Ezekiel. Now, a couple of things, and I alluded to one a minute ago. Ezekiel is 48 chapters long. It is a beautifully representative book of what God has done in the past in terms of, of his justice, but also beautiful in terms of what we look forward to. There's a, a beautiful messianic prophecy, prophecy of Jesus in it, and Prophetic words about how God's going to renew the world. It's really, really, really awesome. But as I said a few minutes ago, it's really weird. Like last night, I was trying to read through some sections of Ezekiel, you know, to kind of finish my preparation. And it's just bizarre. In fact, if I were to compare it to a, another book of the Bible, some of you might be familiar with the book of Revelation in the New Testament. Those two books actually are Somewhat similar, Ezekiel and Revelation. Part of the reason it's weird is because you don't read it the same way that you would read a story. You don't read it the same way you would read a technical manual. It's all poetry. It's symbolic. It's imagery. Which makes it a little odd for us as 21st century readers. So how do we get out of the book what God, I think, really intends for us to, well, the way we're going to do it is by taking this really high-level view, this 20,000-foot view of the book together today. At the end, uh, we'll have a brief moment where Pastor Peter is going to come back out. We have an opportunity for you to respond to all that we're talking about today with Great Commission Sunday, but that's what we're going to do. You good? Cool. This right here is the whole book of Ezekiel. What we're going to do is I'm going to have this on the screen. We're literally going to walk through it from that top left-hand corner to the bottom right-hand corner. All right? As I always say, it's a really good idea. If you would like to read the Bible on your own, you can do so. You have permission. I would encourage you to read the book of Ezekiel. But I would also encourage you to have a good understanding of the whole book before you dive in because it's really easy to get caught in the weeds. Okay? So. This is what we're going to do today, and then again at the end, we'll have a time where Pastor Peter and I will be up here together, giving you an opportunity to respond. Okay. There are four sections in the book of Ezekiel, and the first we'll call a preface, okay, a, a preamble, an introduction. And then there's part one, part two, and part three, which you can see on the screen. We are, at the beginning of the book, introduced to a man named Ezekiel. Ezekiel is a 30-year-old man, Jewish man. We find him sitting next to a river in Babylon, okay? And he has a vision right around his 30th birthday. Likely, as he's sitting there by the river, he's probably depressed. And here's why. Based on the tribe he was a part of, he would be in the service of the temple if he was in Jerusalem, but five years prior, the Babylonians came in, kidnapped him, along with the king, Jehoiakim, as well as many, many others, brought them into Babylon, and he sits here by the side of a river in a refugee camp without God, as he should be starting his service in the temple. There is really nothing like this that we would experience other than maybe you're in a foreign country and you would want to go into public service and you just turn whatever the age is, depending on what office, let's pretend you want to be president, 35 years old in our country, right? You turn 35 and you had aspirations for that, but you're sitting in some foreign country and you're sitting by the river and you're depressed, which is probably the right response. In this moment, Ezekiel receives a vision from God. And what he sees is God himself 
And the language in the book is so vibrant and so strange. God rides in on a chariot throne and It's being carried by these really weird-looking creatures that each one has four faces. That doesn't even make sense. Like, I know sometimes moms have eyes in the back of their head, you know what I'm saying? But, like, it's not like that. It's like four separate, unique faces. And they're different animals. They have multiple sets of wings, which is just, it's all kind of strange. But what's most strange is actually something that you and I wouldn't see at the very beginning. What's most strange is that the presence of God is not in Jerusalem at the temple, which is where it's supposed to be. The presence of God is in exile. And so there's this question that underlays the entire book, which is, has God given up on his people? Has God given up on humanity in general? And that's a question that we're going to see unraveled, or unpacked, rather, as we get through the rest of the book. So, Ezekiel has a vision. God is there. And he is sent to be not a priest in the temple, but a prophet. A much harder job. A prophet's role in the Old Testament is to go and to accuse, to call people out, to say, you need to change your lifestyle or else God's going to punish you. And then he hears probably the worst news of all, which is this. I'm sending you out. You're going to be the one that tells all of these people that they need to repent and they need to come back to me. But oh, by the way, it won't work. There is a really interesting idea there that God might call you to something in life that fails. And you're exactly where God is intending you to be. What a weird idea. But God tells him up front. He says, you're going to go to these people. They will not listen. But you're still going to go. And so Ezekiel, he goes. And he does what he's supposed to do. That's the preface. Let's move now into the first of the four parts of the book. This is from chapters 4 to 11. And during this time, Ezekiel is meant to accuse the people of Israel. Now, I want to be clear with the relationship between God and his people. God is not giving up on the Israelite people because they made a mistake or two and came back. God is accusing them of sin because of centuries of falling away. And so, like, it's easy sometimes to look at the Old Testament and to be like, man, God is so harsh. Why is he so mean? But we don't recognize the fact that it's generation after generation after generation after generation of patience that God is exercising toward the people. And so in this point, Ezekiel is told to accuse the Israelites of wrongdoing against centuries of it. He does so, though, using street theater. A weird medium, not words, not poetry, not songs, but like acting out weird stuff on the street, okay? And some of the stuff he does is really weird. So the first one is he's supposed to build like a little toy model of the city of Jerusalem under siege. And so you imagine him sitting on the, you know, on the concrete outside of, I don't know where, in the middle of the town. And he's building with all these little characters a siege. Super strange. The next one gets progressively weirder. He's supposed to shave his head, and then with part of his hair, I know, it's super weird, he's supposed to burn it, and part of it he's supposed to, like, cut up, and part of it he's supposed to put into his tunic. It's, it's all meant to represent the way that the people have rejected God, and God, therefore, is punishing them. The last one's the weirdest. Are you ready? This might be the weirdest thing in the whole Bible. Maybe. Okay. In this last section, he is supposed to bind himself up with ropes, lay on his side for 390 days. Yeah. 
Oh, and then after that, he's supposed to roll over for 40 more days. And you can check me. I see some confused faces. You can go and check me, book of Ezekiel. But then comes the weirdest part. He's supposed to make bread. Um, but the way he makes bread, and I'm not making this up, is he's supposed to cook it over poop. I know. I know. It's, it's gross. It's disgusting. But if you look at it, I'm not making this up. I couldn't make this up. It's too weird. He's supposed to cook his bread over dung for all, what, 430 days. All to represent the disgusting nature of the way that the Israelites have treated God. As you can see, it's kind of a weird book. We've got angels with multiple faces and God floating around and a big chariot and Weird ways to cook your food. I wouldn't suggest that, by the way. I don't know if anybody's actually thinking about that, but I wouldn't suggest that. Okay, this is the accusation phase. Part one is done of the book of Ezekiel. Part two has three subsections. This is where Ezekiel tells of coming judgment on, wait for it, Israel, the nations, and then specifically on Jerusalem. We'll go through these relatively quickly. Judgment he talks about with Israel, he has these, these various images or metaphors that he uses. He says Israel is like a promiscuous woman and, and is committing adultery on God. And, and Israel is like a burnt stick, an odd illusion, but it doesn't have any purpose. It doesn't have any meaning. It's brittle where it was once strong. He then accuses the nations around Israel, Tyre and Egypt, were two nations that Israel had partnered with, they led Israel away from Yahweh, the God of the Bible. So he says, by the way, you're going to be destroyed by Babylon too. And then at the end of this section, news arrives from the city of Jerusalem that it's been completely destroyed by the Babylonians. At this point in history, Babylon destroyed all of the walls of Jerusalem. They destroyed the temple which, by the way, this temple was unique. The presence of God, as I said before, dwelt there. And now it's in ruin. You see why if we ended here, it'd be really depressing? The presence of God is gone. Even his own people are left. But thankfully, that's not the whole story. We have some more strange stories to look at, but stories with great hope. The most important part of this entire section begins at the intersection between chapter 33 in the judgments section and chapter 34. And in that short span, there is promise of a future king. A future king that's going to reign in Jerusalem, that's going to make all things right. One that we celebrated, by the way, when we took communion earlier as a family. That Jesus will make it right. Praise God. And so there's, there's a bit of an application point here. That if you are in a place where you feel like everything in life has gone wrong, where if you feel like there is no hope for you, or if you feel like a burnt stick, that the power of the Messiah is for you too. That Jesus has come to rescue all that would choose to follow him, no matter your past, no matter your struggles, no matter your history. And so we get to see for the first time this glimmer of hope that a king is going to come, sit on the throne in Israel, rule forever, and make all things right. Now, in this section, there's three subsections. Again, hope for Israel, hope for the nations, and hope for all of creation. The section we read at the beginning, if you remember that, I know we've tread a lot of territory since, is in that last section. And so let's just... Look here at this first part. Again, we talked a little bit about the Messiah coming, but there's this really interesting story, and maybe you've heard of it, but 
I think the context is really important here. During this section, in chapters 34, 35, Ezekiel has this vision. Of course, this is after he sees the Messiah. He sees a valley with a bunch of bones in it, all dry, all long dead bones. And a wind goes through it. The Spirit of God goes through it. The bones begin to shake and tremble. They come together. They create skeletons. I know it's weird. And flesh starts to grow on these skeletons. Skin envelops them. The breath of God brings them back to life. And instead of dry bones, there's now living, breathing flesh. If you were to break this section of the book of Ezekiel up historically, this is the world we live in. The Messiah, Jesus, has come. And by the power of God's Spirit, he's making dead people alive. People far from him, back into relationship with him. And it's a permanent fix. Not just a sacrifice, not just a, I did it right for a week or two. But forever, God is changing people. And so that's this first beautiful vision that Israel is going to be remade, that God's spirit is transforming the world by bringing life where there was death. We then see a similar vision of the nations. And the nations are described in this section as Gog, particularly the evil nations. And Gog is defeated by the power of God. And there's crazy symbolism. He's defeated like four different ways. He's killed on the battlefield and left there. And then he's burned up. And then he's consumed by an earthquake. And so it's definitely meant to be imagery, symbolic. But the idea is this, that God will completely do away with evil. I'm ready for that day. And then we get to the last part, the renewing of creation. In this last section, as we get to the end of the book, there's a vision that Ezekiel has of a new temple. And this temple is huge. And it's actually being treated properly. Whereas the temple in Jerusalem was used for false gods, it's the reason that God left in the first place, this one is used the right way, to worship Yahweh. It's set in a new garden. God returns to the temple. And then we have this interesting statement right at the end of the book in chapter 47. Out of the doors of the temple flow this stream. And the stream starts as just a little, a little brook. And then it grows and it gets bigger. And it gets bigger. Ezekiel is told to wade through it. It starts at his ankles. Then it goes up to his knees. Then it's up to his hip. And by the end, he can't even ford through the river. The river then goes into the most desolate place in this part of the world where the Dead Sea Valley is. And it brings life where it comes. Whereas when we bring life into death, death usually wins, right? You put fresh water into salt water, it doesn't make the salt water fresh. It's the opposite. The life and the power of the Spirit of God transforms death and evil. And it's a beautiful sight. There's fish, there's trees, there's beauty. There is life as you and I know it is meant to be. The right way. And that's the book of Ezekiel. Weird, strange, filled with crazy symbols, and one of the most beautiful books of the Bible. Because God takes what's broken and he makes it new. Today is a day of tremendous celebration. Communion is always a day to celebrate. Because it's God's active moment of saying, 
This future is coming, and here's the deposit for it. Baptism is this very idea of dry bones turning into, fro- into flesh, turning into living, breathing bodies. And then the idea that the Spirit goes out and brings life where there's death. We get to participate in this work. That's what the Great Commission is. We've talked about it a few times today. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them. Teach them to observe everything I've commanded you, Jesus said. He partners with us to transform the world. And every one of us in here, likely, not necessarily guaranteed, every one of us in here, very, very likely, are here because somebody told us about Jesus. Because someone else engaged in the Great Commission. And so, as we wrap this book up, we're going to have an opportunity to respond in the Great Commission work. And I have a short video to help get us started on that. Hey, I'm Tim, and I'm coming to you today from my church, the Crosswalk Church here in Reynoldsburg, Ohio. It's where my family and I join for weekly worship. We're a group of churches in the Alliance, and we're all working together to join Jesus in completing his Great Commission. As you may know, at our recent council, we entered into this now moment as a family of churches where we set some goals for ourselves to plant more churches and to see God open doors around the world. And one of those goals was to raise up new workers for the harvest. We started praying like Jesus commanded in the book of Luke to pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would raise up workers and he's answering the prayer. In fact, right now, we are seeing more workers sign up to go overseas than we even set out or even prayed for. The question is, will you send them by participating in this year's Great Commission Day offer? In the Alliance, we are people who believe in the Great Commission because we love Jesus and we love people. It's not just about these willing workers, it's about all of us. It's about the young and the not so young in local churches just like this one. It's about all of us joining in to complete the Great Commission. And so in real terms, that means we need to give financially. We need to pray for these workers. We need to participate in what God is not only inviting us into, but also commanding us to do. So as a family of churches, will we send these new workers to the least reached places? So I've got Pastor Peter up here. Uh, we were, uh, he was here a little bit earlier today sharing communion with us. Uh, Pastor Peter oversees our missions efforts uh, throughout the world as well here at Gateway Church. And so, Peter, if you would just kind of maybe give us a little bit of a feel of uh, what Great Commission Day is, what the Great Commission Fund is, how people can participate, and so on. For sure. So one of the things that we get every once in a while here at the church is Um, We love the fact that you guys are a non-denominational, non-affiliated church. And whenever we hear that, we're kind of like, well, actually, we are affiliated. Um, We are a part of a denomination called the Christian and Missionary Alliance. And at the heart of this movement, of this denomination, is a desire to go deep with God and a desire to partner with him and go into the world and bring in the gospel to these different places. It was birthed in a moment where a guy was like, I'm discontent with the way my church is currently reaching out to people. People don't know the stories of the people across the world where, where the gospel hasn't gone yet, and people are trying to share that, but, but we need to bridge that gap. We need to bring people together. We need to send people into these hard spaces because we love Jesus, and he's so good. We want others to know him as well. And out of that has birthed this alliance of churches that partner around this deeper life and around um, going to the world. And so one of the ways we do that is, you kind of heard this guy up here uh, is um, a member of our our national office, and he is talking about our desire to send new workers into these spaces, to send 52 workers a year, 52 new workers a year. One a week is where that number comes from. And in order to do that, resources have to come together. The way the Alliance does that is kind of twofold. 
missionaries will do some fundraising on their own to support to support the work that God's called them to. But we come together as a huge church, as a huge family, and we say we want to create a fund that can help support these different missions around the world. And so we raise funds as a whole family to do that. And the Great Commission Day offering is a way to remember and put the Great Commission at the forefront of the way that we think about what Jesus has called us to again and then ask the question, how can we partner with what Jesus is doing? It's awesome. It's awesome. So um, if we want to uh, be involved in the Great Commission work of our church tribe, the, the Alliance, what are some ways that we can do that? Yeah. So, um, I was, so here's the thing. You can give, you can pray, and you can go. Right? Those three things. But I'm going to change the order for a second. I wanted to go in that order, but after listening to Ezekiel, um, I want to start with go. I was going to land there. But this story in Ezekiel is so outward. Do you see that? Did you see that flow? Like, it just goes outward. The, the, the river goes outward. And the people that were focused on wanting the temple here and to be with them and the presence of God all of a sudden are being sent out to the nations like a river filled with the presence of God to go out to all these other places because they need hope too. And God might want to use you to be that person. That's how this works. The Holy Spirit gets all the glory. He has all the power. He's the one who makes it function, but he's chosen to say, I'm going to go through you. And I'm going to go through you. So maybe you're feeling that call. You're sensing that call. And if you are, you don't have to be sure about it. But explore it. Talk to somebody who knows you well. Think about it. You can come talk to me. Okay. Does that mean that we have to go to, like, somewhere overseas in Africa to participate? I just thought I would ask, because I know you were probably thinking it. So. Okay, maybe yes. Okay, okay maybe. You know okay. What? Maybe yes, we do have to go overseas. Maybe we do. Maybe that's where your calling goes. But if, it, if not, there is a city called Elk River that we happen to be a part of right now. And there are people here in Elk River who don't know Jesus. There are people here in Elk River who are hurt deeply by the church and need to see what Jesus is like through you. So no, not necessarily. But don't hear in that no, not necessarily. <gasps> okay, I, God will never ask me to go somewhere else. No, he will. And he may. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't also just say, like, hey, you're right here right now. Do this. Be with me here right now in this space as well. Okay? So if you want to explore that more, whether here or there, you can find me. Or I'll be over at Starting Point outside. We can chat about that. Okay, that was my last point. Now I'm going to go backwards. I'm going to start with, uh, go back to give. This is a moment where we look at the resources needed to go and partner with Jesus in this and to go to these places where there is no access to Jesus' name or his story. And we say, yes, we are going to part with you even from our wallets. And so if you wanted to do that, you could follow this QR code. It'll take you to the Our Giving page, and you can sign up for the first time if you haven't ever done it before. But otherwise, you can choose the drop-down option of GC Day, Great Commission Day, and your funds that go into that, like any gift that goes there right now is doubled. Okay, there's a grant out there that doubles your gift, and it goes to these workers who are saying, yes, we're, we actually, there's a call in our lives to cross a culture. And so it goes to helping make that happen. So you can give, you could go, and then the last one is prayer. I mean, the story of Ezekiel is the story of the spirit working and the spirit moving and the spirit saying, I'm not done yet. So our great power as the church is to get down on our knees and be like, Spirit, do the thing you want to do. And so I want to challenge you, any missionaries that you're already loving on and supporting, pray for them. Be encouraged to keep doing that and don't give up. We here at Gateway are partnered with a, a focal area in Berlin, Germany, and our prayer is that gospel access would come back to that area. And so come talk to me again at Starting Point, and I can get you hooked up with prayer for Berlin, Germany. And we can partner in prayer and ask the Spirit to move there, too. We can give, we can pray, and we can go. Awesome. That's what I got. Cool. Well, why don't we close this time in prayer? we got one additional worship song here in a second. Lord, I just thank you so much for, uh, for your word in Ezekiel. I thank you, Lord, also for the opportunity that you've given us to uh, participate 
in this incredible work of, uh, of the Great Commission. And uh, Lord, if, if you're stirring in our hearts to have a different kind of conversation with a neighbor or to go all the way to another country, I pray, Lord, wherever we are in that, um, that, uh, that you would spark uh, desire in our hearts, give us courage to say yes, and we pray, Lord, that your spirit would move. And uh, we just thank you, God, um, that you sought to have us told about you through whoever it was that told us. And so may we be people that tell others as well. In Jesus' name, amen.